Albert McCleary was um, a, a deeply involved theater person. He loved the theater. He had been teaching at Fordham University and teaching theater arts there. And uh, in the earliest days of television, I think <clears throat> 1948, 49, um, he, did, he did some work in television. Uh, I, I'm not sure the exact show. But he came in as a producer because he'd had this great theater background. He was a passionate theater person. He could never get enough. He went to the theater all the time, and his whole background, his whole thinking was theater. So he came into the medium of live television, which was a strange, strange, and I'll use the word, it was a bastard medium because it was somewhat theater, a little bit movies, and yet it was its own baby. And Albert came into that world with this great theater background, and he had a very flamboyant personality and a very flamboyant touch, really. And he was looking at budgets, he analyzed budgets and everything, and he came up with the concept of cameo staging, he called it, which was a very nice way of saying, we don't have enough money for a complete set with all of the chairs and the tables and the walls and everything else. So we will do suggestive staging. There will be a table over here and a piece of a wall over here. It will be like, and he keep, kept referring to this, Shakespeare's Globe Theater, <clears throat> which was an, an outdoor theater in London, but which was simply a, a stage, a thrust stage. And they'd have a few plants. And in the famous Shakespearean play, Henry V, the, the narrative voice comes out and addresses the audience. And he says, my language, not Shakespeare's, picture, if you will, the battlefields of France. Picture, if you will, the court of Henry, and so on. And that's what, you know, they had a few pieces around the stage. And Albert used to refer to that all the time. You, it's, it's the audience's imagination which we have to invoke. Would he quote that specific passage? Oh, he would quote it a lot. He would quote that a lot. And so anybody that went to work in any capacity for Al McCleary knew about cameo staging. Al's credit on the screen on any live show that he did was devised and produced by Albert McCleary, or on, on occasion devised and directed by Albert McCleary. Devised meant that he felt that he had devised this way of staging. In other words, uh, don't use literal sets, you use suggested pieces. And the actors and the actors' faces would be up front and so on. And we used to kid him a lot, and you know, uh, you're also saving a lot of money, Al, you know. <laughs> Which was really, I think, probably what got this started. But he did devise this staging. Can you describe him a little personally for me? Yes. he was. Uh, Colorful comes to mind as a word. He was, he was an eccentric person. Um, I remember running into him one day on the street corner. He had just had a meeting somewhere, and I ran. It, this was right at uh, Selma and Vine, right where we had our offices. And I was uh, talking to him about some problem, and suddenly an alarm rang. And he looked down at his wrist. It was his watch. And he turned around and walked away. He had an appointment. But that was, that was Albert. I mean, he... <laughs> he he was of the moment, and um, always on the go. Always on the go. Always on the go. Albert uh, uh, felt that movement was achievement. Now he achieved a great deal, but he would get on the plane and fly to New York, and then fly to back, fly back frequently, constantly. And this was before jets, so it was an eight-hour flight. And he would always, Albert would always find himself sitting next to somebody who would try to sell him a script, a story of some kind. So when he'd finish, when he'd complete the trip from New York, he'd come back, he'd come into my little office, and he'd say, listen, will you do me a favor? Will you phone this guy and this guy and this guy? Because the <laughs> he would say, can you get me out of this? So I, I would always have strangers to call and say, 
Uh, Mr. McCleary, uh, you know, isn't uh, isn't available right now, but uh, you know, uh, whatever you've got, tell me about it, and so on. But it was always get me out of this, and he he was movement was accomplishment. He was up and down the corridors all the time. NBC had a casting office at the end of one corridor that was essentially involved with matinee theater and other NBC shows. And he would come into that casting office all the time and he'd make an announcement. Like, um, he'd walk in and he'd say, Boris Karloff, and he'd turn around and walk out. They knew, what they bet, try and find Boris Karloff, we'd like to use him on matinee theater. That's, he was of the moment, always. If I had a problem, Peter Kortner had a problem, anybody had a problem, we would arrange a meeting, we'd go in to see him, and state the problem, and he would shout back an answer of some kind, which we realized when we were in the corridor didn't, didn't, wasn't responsive. He just didn't want to deal with it. Um, Albert had a temper, a huge, huge temper, which all of us learned how to deal with. Uh, I, I learned particularly because he was displeased with something, and he would explode at whoever was standing in front of him. I was standing in front of him a lot of the time, and he would, he would turn beet red with anger, and he would shout, and he would spit. But I knew him, so I just weathered the storm. I'd just stand there and look at him, and in a moment, you know, he'd calm down. That would be that, and then we'd start to talk rationally. But he had a hair-trigger temper. Who was and he angry at? What were the problems? He would be angry, really, at the problem. He'd be angry at the problem, and why haven't you solved it, even though you have nothing to do with it? I mean, that was simply, he was, he was an expressive, deeply emotional person, and would just explode. It would just come out. And, uh, was he that way with uh, the networks or the sponsors? Well, I think probably in network meetings, probably, but he was a shrewd man. He wasn't going to yell at Pat Weaver, you know, the head of the network. But I would, my guess would be that was him. I don't think he turned it off and on. I think that was, that was Albert. He also had, he had, um, he was a very well-dressed man, very well-tailored man. And um, I think that was, that was important to him. I think he wanted uh, great consideration, great respect, and he got it. Um, he was not one to care too much about the details of matinee theater in terms of daily production. It was just too much. That's why he hired a staff. But sometimes those problems erupted, you know, budget particularly, and he would then have to get into it. Frequent, I, on many occasions, he would walk into a rehearsal hall because he'd known an actor, a prominent actor, or he wanted to come in and say hello, welcome to matinee theater. He was very good that way. But if in the course of saying hello to an actor, a problem developed, the actor would say to him, boy, is this a mess. Can you stay here for a while and figure this out? And Albert would say, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll handle it. We'll handle it. And he would get out of there. He would not want to deal with the moment-by-moment -moment crises. He just didn't want to do that. But as a human being, he was an intriguing, eccentric personality really intriguing. Um, it, was, it was like you were working for uh, a character actor in a good movie, you know, I mean, playing a part. But the part was, re he was real. There was nothing feigned. But there nothing. was a larger than life quality. Yes, okay. yeah, I mean, he had that, he had that quality. And sometimes, it, Albert made mistakes because of that emotional situation. He would, he would, he was not afraid to to criticize just before air. So on, on those occasions when I was out at the studio uh, with Peter Kortner, with, with other people, um, and he was there and he would talk to the actors. Um, not a good idea if the director's in the booth, you know, but he would talk to the actors and he would say something that was not totally coherent at the moment. It was just out of his motion, uh, emotion and tend to throw the actor. Then the director would have to say, all right, calm down, that was just Albert, just easy does it. 
he, I'm not implying that he was, he was a, a bad professional. He was a great professional, but he had that personal, larger than life, eccentricity about him. He was perfect to run the store, a perfect person in terms of meeting people, of dealing with all of the problems that he must have had at the network. He was ideal for that. Not so good on the intimate level of de dealing with problems that arose in a, in a building production. 